good afternoon everyone uh, i hope uh, this morning has been quite well for all of you so i welcome all of you and uh, if you have any issues please uh, no raise your hand or uh, no mention your questions in the q and a section uh, and uh, we'll just start the proceedings thank you so uh, today uh, we are here for the webinar uh, for cardiovascular and vo2 max assessment uh, and to start with uh, as an application specialist from ad instruments india myself chetan uh, i welcome all of you and our esteemed speaker dr ruchi kothari from uh, mahatma gandhi institute of Social sciences and all our distinguished panelists attendees uh, present at this webinar organized by adia adi as we all know that the outbreak of the coronavirus has shocked all the world due to which health medicine education business economy almost all the different sectors are severely affected at present every aspect of local and global education suffers from crisis of covid-19 as well during this pandemic it is very important to keep updated and connected keeping the same goal in mind we at ed instruments with our mission of making science easier for your research and education are organizing events that can help us all stay connected and updated with the latest techniques and technologies at our disposal continuing our ongoing webinars today we are here organizing the webinar on cardiovascular and co2 max assessment in collaboration with dr ruchi kothari from mahatma gandhi institute of medical sciences wardha there is a lot to talk about dr kothari she has uh, been actively involved in running the exercise physiology and wireless physiology lab at this rural institute she has an extensive teaching experience of more than 16 years as a physiologist has published more than 72 research papers in the various index journals of international and national repute she has undergone an extensive training on exercise physiology as well as wireless equivital physiology instruments at ad instruments new delhi office she has presented 31 research papers at many national as well as international platforms and she is also a very great mentor because she has mentored five students from icmr sts projects seven students for muhs sponsored student short term research grant projects she attended over 30 conferences and have actively participated in around 24 workshops she has organized workshops on stress management through yoga she has no she is the guest faculty for pre conference workshop on exercise physiology in natcon physiology in 2019 as well so all these reputations all these achievements uh, are are shorter or smaller for ma'am when she will start speaking today because she is again uh, writing a new chapter in online webinars as well so i welcome uh, Dr. Ruchi Kothari, and I will hand over the dais to her. Welcome, ma'am. Good afternoon. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction, and I would like to wish everybody over here, the panelists, the organizers, and the attendees, uh, namaste and warm greetings from the land of Bapu. Uh, well, I belong to Seva Gram, that is a non-descript village nestled in the karma bhumi of the father of our nation. and it is a treasure trove of historical anecdotes so before i go ahead with my presentation first and foremost i would like to thank the team of ad instruments for giving me this opportunity which was more of a challenge for me because i am not a too tech savvy or an online teacher so it's uh, supposed to be my first endeavor in this particular field so i would like to uh, shed some light on the significance of this village and its history Uh, conceptualized with the early wisdom of bapu the creation of mgims was an endeavor to sensitize fresh medical graduates to the real india that needed them that is the rural india mgims was founded as the first rural medical college of the country in 1969 under the tutelage of dr sushila nair who is fondly referred as badi behen ji our college is a landmark which symbolizes independent india's first attempt in giving a new direction to the rural health 
Well, after more than five decades of its birth, MGIMS is still committed to the pursuit of exemplary standards of professional excellence in medical education, research, and accessible yet affordable healthcare, especially to the underprivileged rural communities. Well, soon after the SARS-CoV-2 had upturned the world and when our entire country was forced into lockdown, we at Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Sevagram, with our indomitable spirit of serving the rural India, are working on the forefront in the battle against the COVID-19. So friends, in the wake of the current COVID-19 health scare and the pandemic wrath, I would suggest that maintaining obtain optimum VO2 max and regular surveillance of aerobic capacity is more relevant now than ever, where the end stage of the disease comes down to the respiratory distress, which can be very accurately predicted in its preliminary stages through the parameters which I shall be demonstrating in my webinar today. So although we are all trying our level best to prevent this unwanted guest from knocking at that door, but even if you do end up getting infected from COVID, having a better lung health does indeed ensure a higher chance of survival and a better prognosis. So I would now proceed on with my presentation and the first segment is related to assessment of VO2 max. So the highlights of my presentation include a historical background related to exercise physiology, uh, a brief introduction to exercise physiology system, the hardware software specification. Then I would take you over to the concept of VO2 max, the indications and the clinical circumstances where you might be subjected to this kind of a testing, the concerns prior to performing the test, which have to be kept in the mind of the physiologist or the treating physician. And what exactly are we doing in this assessment is what is known as a running maximal oxygen consumption test. So I'll be teaching you the protocol and the indications, precautions, and what are the basic results that we obtain. Finally, ending up my uh, session for this VO2 max with the data acquisition and the interpretation, including the analysis and concluding with the clinical implications. So this is the brief layout of the entire presentation. I begin my discussion with the uh, historical background, wherein we can state that this discipline of exercise physiology dates back to early 20th century where in 1927, the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory was founded. And for the succeeding two decades, the researchers had this facility where numerous studies that advanced our knowledge on the physiologic and the metabolic responses to exercise were founded. Now from those rather humble origins, exercise physiology has grown dramatically. So that is, now a focus of the academic research and training in most major universities across the globe or around the world. Regarding the new frontiers in exercise physiology, for a successful performance of the sports person, it requires the integration of multiple physiological and psychological systems working together to regulate the exercise intensity in a way that is going to reduce the time taken and increase the work output. So the current approach these days is to emphasize on the cardiorespiratory physiology and hence the topic of our webinar assessment of VO2 max. Because here we are going to see the integration of the brain with the multiple organs and the systems which is gaining momentum these days. So the hardware and the software specifications. First, we are going to talk about the system that we are using in our lab. That is the exercise physiology system. Uh, it is a complete system for monitoring cardiorespiratory and metabolic functions, and it records and displays continuous real-time measurements of carbon dioxide and oxygen concentrations, airflow, temperature of the respired air, etc. Uh, this system includes a power lab data acquisition system with lab chart pro software with the metabolic module. 
I would like to tell you uh, a little bit about the power lab, uh, which is uh, the model which we have got with us in our lab is 8 by 35. It is an integrated system of hardware and it is de designed to record, display and analyze the various experimental data. Once the power lab transfers the data to the computer, it becomes available for display, manipulation, printing, storage and retrieval. So the number 8 by 35, it indicates that there are eight inputs for recording the external signals. Uh, as you can see here, they are numbered from 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on up till 8. So here, this one is 7 and 8. So it has eight inputs which are numbered for recording the external signals. Coming back to the metabolic module, the metabolic module is included with the lab chart and uh, it extends the capability of the lab chart software. It is available in both the versions, Windows and Macintosh, and it provides a comprehensive set of features for the metabolic data acquisition and analysis from the human beings. This module basically requires three channels of data, that is the carbon dioxide concentration with the units of percentage CO2, oxygen concentration with the units of percent oxygen, and airflow with the units of liters per second. The units for temperature, if they are recorded, they have to be specified as degree centigrade, degree Fahrenheit, or Kelvin. The other parts of the exercise physiology system are the gas analyzer. So uh, for the gas analyzer, I would like you to know that it is a set of transducers that allows continuous measurement of respiratory gas concentrations in the expired air. It actually houses an infrared carbon dioxide sensor and an optical visible spectrum oxygen detector, which samples the expired air from the mixing chamber. Generally, it is provided with a drying tube, which is an aphion tubing that is meant for drying the gas streams and also provided with an inline filter, again, to provide the uh, prevent the device from any kind of damage against uh, moisture or any particulate matter. The other part that is associated with the gas analyzer is a gas mixing chamber, which is meant for collecting and mixing the uh, sample gases, and it has a capacity of about 4.7 liters. Then next in sequence, we have a spirometer. So this is another picture where you can see the accessory kit, the exercise physiology exercise accessory kit, which contains the respiratory flow head. Again, it has, uh, this is the respiratory flow head and it is having a capacity of around 1000 liters per minute. It is suitable for use on adults during exercise. This flow head is attaching to the spirometer and it is used to record the airflow. A fine gaze mesh, rapidly equilibrates in temperature with the air to reduce the problems of condensation. Uh, a laminar airflow through the mesh is providing us a pressure differential which is linearly proportional to the velocity. Now the ports of the flow head when we are uh, attaching and setting up our hardware, we should keep in mind that they should always be pointing upwards in order to minimize the chance of moisture condensing and blocking the tube connecting the flow head to the spirometer. Now the respiratory flow head attaches to the spirometer and uh, as I just told you it is also provided with a uh, uh, inline filter and it has to be uh, securely connected with the uh, main system of spirometer which is testing our lung function and the airflow. Regarding spirometers, we know that uh, they measure the amount of air a subject can breathe in and breathe out of the lungs and how hard and fast they can breathe out. They are essential for research purposes which are assessing respiration or which uh, in which the researcher is uh, aiming at examination of the restrictive or chronic obstructive lung diseases, any kind of airway resistance and the pulmonary function. So it is a precision differential pressure transducer for the measurements of the respiratory flow rates. Then we have a thermistor pod, which is meant for uh, 
measuring the temperature of the expired air and it is suitable for the biological measurements there like the skin temperature and the nasal temperature and it detects the temperature in the range of 5 degrees to 45 degrees it is provided with a temperature sensor and it is attached to the gas mixing chamber and the analyzer for the carbon dioxide and oxygen analysis now it connects the sensor connects with the help of the thermistor pod so here uh, i would be showing you that uh, these are the tubings and uh, this is these are the other accessories which are included as a part of exercise physiology accessory kit i have taught you about the respiratory flow head a uh, little bit about the face mask and the breathing tube a uh, silicon face mask as it is visible in this diagram uh, it appears or it is available in two sizes small and medium sizes and it is provided with a head strap and there is a y shaped two way non breathing re uh, valve that is available uh, along with this face mask which is supposed to separate the inspired air and the expired air so that we use the valve that allows the flow in one direction only that is the subject is supposed to uh, exhale through the breathing tube this is the breathing tube about uh, 180 cm this one uh, as i am pointing out in the diagram is the desiccant cartridge and the drying tube so the purpose of desiccant cartridge if you can uh, i think i'll not be able to zoom it you can pin zoom in your cell and uh, or whichever device you are accessing with uh, there are certain white granular particles which are uh, visible these are actually the silica gel which are meant for removing the water from the gas stream and then this breathing tube it is about 180 cm long as i just told you and it is a long smooth bore tubing with integral end fittings and they are again meant for connection at one end with the gas mixing chamber and the on the other hand it has to connect to the face mask the other accessories are flow head adapter and the connector that is tubing adapter where it has to connect this flow head with the gas mixing chamber moving further uh, look at the front panel of the gas analyzer a few things i would like to highlight for the attendees over here you have the setup for uh, metabolic gas analyzer then these things have to be kept in mind while you are uh, in the process of beginning the investigation so first and foremost there is a power indicator this one this socket is uh, the power indicator it is going to glow blue when the power is connected properly so you know that your system is now on then status indicator just below that it is going to glow green when the gas analyzer is connected to the power lamp and it has been recognized by your software that is a lab chart next to that we have a pump switch indicator and a switch pump on indicator and the switch which is going to glow orange or yellow when it is functioning and next to that we have this gas sample inlet port which is directly connected to the internal gas transducers of the gas analyzer so that the sample flows through this port and that can be analyzed so this is the medium through which your uh, exhaled air is going to reach to the analyzer for the analysis lastly we have the flow control that is providing us a range of flow rates from 35 to 200 ml one minute per minute and here again i would like you all to note down this point that when you are using this gas analyzer for the human subjects the flow rate should always be set to the maximal speed so rotate it all the way round towards the right side uh, regarding the back panel not going into too much technical details but two important point where i would like to emphasize the first is regarding the exhaust port now this gas sample exhaust port the first knob that you are able to see in the diagram here you are uh, supposed to keep in mind that this port should always be unobtrusive because this is the one which is expelling the sample air to the atmosphere so impending this port is going to prevent a clear flow of the sample and that is maybe going to result into a reduction in the accuracy of your recording so keep it unobtrusive 
The second thing I would like to highlight is the analog outputs, which are proportional to the carbon dioxide and the oxygen concentration of the sample gas, which is finally connected to the data recorder in order to provide the signals. Next to it, uh, you can make out that there is a cooling fan outlet or also which is present because a lot of heat is going to be generated. So it needs to be emitted. Uh, this I've already discussed. So this is how a gas mixing chamber looks like. You can see it's a kind of a filter which is meant for measuring, uh, collecting as well as mixing the sample of gases. And it is provided with these two uh, exhaust ports and inlet ports around 35 millimeter in dimension or diameter. Now we are going to take you to a video tour through the devices which we are using as a part of the exercise physiology system. So this is the lab chat view in which all the recordings that we make during the cardiorespiratory assessment have been plotted along with the plots of the respiratory gases and time, the various channel settings and the log window. Now I take you to the stacked configuration of the complete exercise physiology system that records and analyzes the cardiorespiratory and metabolic parameters. So we have the power lab data acquisition system that is PL8 by 35. Moving on to the gas analyzer, which is analyzing the carbon dioxide and the oxygen content from the expired air. On top of it, you can see that there is a thermistor port that has been placed and it records or takes the temperature signals from the thermistor sensor that is located at the exit of the gas mixing chamber. Besides the thermistor port is a bioamp, which is a single channel bioamp that is used to measure the various biopotentials can be ECG or EMG. Next, we have the spirometer, which is place to take the airflow signals from the flow head that is attached to the gas mixing chamber. Then there is a desiccant cartridge that has been placed which contains the silica gel and it removes the excess moisture from the expired air and thus protects the sensors which are present in the gas analyzer. So the spirometer gets the respiratory flow signal from the flow head which is attached to the gas mixing chamber. The purpose of this chamber is to collect and mix the expired gases and sample it to the gas analyzer. The gas mixing chamber is connected to a face mask with the help of this breathing tube. Welcome to the sports physiology lab of MDMS Devagram. So this is our subject preparation room where we are going to show all the steps that we follow during preparing a subject for the exercise. So I hope you all uh, had a clearer view and a concept of how uh, the devices are placed. As I mentioned in the video also, it has to be a uh, I hope you all have uh, gone through the video and must have uh, visualized how the setup has to be made in the sports physiology lab. It has to be a stacked configuration, as I also mentioned. And I do not know how many of the participants have noticed that I've placed the spirometer a little, uh, about five centimeters away from the main setup of metabolic analyzer and the uh, gas analyzer and the power lab. Can anyone guess a reason for that? Why can't we pay, place the spirometer on the top of the power lab or on top of the bio app? I give you a time of about one minute. You can give me the answer in the chat section. Why don't we place the spirometer on top of the power lab and why we are keeping it at a distance of around five centimeters, that is away from the main system?
So I've got uh, an answer uh, which is close to what I was expecting. Thank you so much for the uh, replies. I would like to clarify here again that we are not keeping it closer because of the heat. So many of you have got the correct answer that uh, the temperature of the power lab and the metabolic gas analyzer is definitely going to alter the values that are being assessed. That is the gas analysis. So I'm going good with my <laughs> responses from the attendees. So keep the momentum on. Uh, moving further with the presentation. Coming on to what is VO2 max. So by definition, although it has been defined in a variety of ways, uh, the basic definition I would like to highlight here uh, was the one which was given from the English physiologist Archibald Vivian Hill, who said that maximal oxygen uptake is the single best measure of cardiorespiratory efficiency. And it is actually the level of oxygen consumption beyond which no further increase in oxygen consumption occurs with a further increase in the severity of exercise. Now, the VO2 max is reflecting the upper limit of the body's aerobic functioning. And so it is the most widely used parameter that characterizes the effective integration of central nervous system, cardiopulmonary system, and the metabolic systems. So it has also been called as aerobic capacity. And as per definition, they say that it is the peak value of VO2 obtained from the incremental exercise test to volitional fatigue. I would like to mention the V alphabet stands here for the volume of the oxygen that is being consumed. I would like the attendees to please pay attention and keep these things in mind because you will be subjected to a poll survey after the session. So be ready with your answers then. Another way of uh, defining VO2 max is that it is the highest attainable rate of aerobic metabolism during the performance of rhythmic muscular work that exhausts a subject within Seems to be, uh, ma'am, lost the connection. Uh, she is resuming again. Just bear with us. Thank you. There seems to be a technical uh, issue with the network. Uh, Nam is just trying to rejoin again. Please bear with us. Meanwhile, uh, till the time, uh, you know, if you have any questions till now with the setup or uh, know how uh, what has Madam explained, uh, you can drop those questions in the Q and A, and we will try to answer those. Thank you.
Am I audible to the audience? Uh, Chetan, please let me know. There was a technical glitch, I think. We lost yeah, yeah, the yeah. Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, now it's all right, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Everything is okay. So I'll get back to my presentation. I sure. think uh, I was discussing the definition of VO2 max. Uh, is it the place from where I need to start? Just let me know. Yes, ma'am. Okay, please. fine. Okay. So extremely sorry for the discomfort. Uh, the indications for the VO2 max testing, that is why should you go for a test of VO2 max? How does a clinician or a physician uh, get an idea or when should he prescribe actually what is the VO2 max testing for? So generally it is uh, used to uh, estimate the aerobic capacity or the fitness of an individual, whether it is an athlete or a healthy individual. It can also be used for estimation of prognosis of the coronary artery diseases. It also helps you to assess the likelihood and the extent of coronary artery disease, the effect of treatment that you are providing, the evaluation and the management of patients with a wide variety of cardiovascular conditions, including the valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease, arrhythmias, and peripheral arterial diseases. For uh, a physiologist, you should be knowing the cardiorespiratory parameter of the subjects in order to assess the work capacity of healthy individuals because physiology stands for being normal. So the fitness status of the various defense forces, the army personnel, the athletes, and the persons who are working in similar occupations. It is also used to aid in the diagnosis of the heart and lung diseases and VO2 max is also assessed pre as well as post operatively to evaluate the cardiothoracic patients for the rehabilitation of the cardiac invalids and surveillance of post infarction and diabetic patients. It is also a mandatory test which should be performed to respond assess the respiratory function of the patients who are going for any surgical operation, especially prior to general anesthesia. Also, it can be used for monitoring the efficiency and efficacy of any kind of physical training that has been provided or any yogic practice that you are undergoing. Now, what are the major concerns for us as a sports physiologist or an exercise physiologist? First and foremost is the subject preparation. How do you prepare your subject for this particular investigation? So again, a video tour for my participants and attendees. I will pause my presentation here and take you to a video clip. Welcome to the Sports Physiology Lab of MDMS Sevagram. So this is a subject preparation room where we are going to show all the steps that we follow during preparing a subject for the exercise. This is the chest strap of a wireless heart rate kit which is first applied over the subject's chest. It is designed to transmit the heart rate signals. It is connected to the power lab via a polar receiver interface cable and it is ideal for measuring the heart rate, especially during exercise. And it comes in three sizes. This is an equivital SEM or sensor electronic module which is first switched on that is depicted by the blinking light and is then placed in the equivital wireless ECT sensor belt or the vest which also comes in various sizes. The fitting of this vest should be such that the electrodes placed on its inside remain in close contact with the subject's chest for proper ECG recording. So here you can see that it is tightly fitted over the subject's skin and the electrodes are well in contact. Now, this is a face mask kit, which is provided with a silicon face mask that comes in adult and pediatric sizes, according to the different subjects. And it is having a Y-shaped two-way non-rebreathing valve, which separates the inspired and expired breaths. 
This face mask is applied over the subject's face such that the chin rests on the lower portion of the mask and no air escapes out when the subject exhales. The head cap with the velcro and the buckles is used to fix the face mask securely so that it doesn't come off during exercise. So it is snugly fitted. Now the breathing tube is attached to the breathing valve of the face mask and it is carrying the exhaled air to the gas mixing chamber. This black cable which you are seeing is a polar receiver cable which offers wireless connectivity between polar transmitter and receiver. So I hope the preparation of the subject was clear. Uh, you might have noticed that the subject is wearing a wireless vest, which is containing the equipments and the electrodes which are required for wireless ECG recording. That is the second part of uh, the second segment of our webinar. Now moving to the second thing that is choosing a test type. Before actually going on to the type of the test, uh, I could read from the chats that one of our attendees is asking what are the precautions that you should take before going uh, to the actual uh, testing of the subject. So the subject should be instructed not to eat or smoke at least two hours prior to the test. Unusual physical exertion should be avoided before testing. Specific questioning should determine the drugs which are being taken. The labeled medications should also be brought along so that the medication can be identified and recorded. A written informed consent is a mandate. It is almost always required and the indication of the test should be known to the subject whom you are testing. The supervising physician should be made aware of any recent deterioration of the patient's clinical status. So although the diagnostic exercise testing in patients without known CAD are best performed by withholding the cardioactive medications on the day of the test to better assess for an ischemic response, functional testing in the patients with known CAD might be best performed when they have taken their usual medications to evaluate the effects. The test should not be performed on the subjects who are markedly hypertensive, that is whose blood pressure values are more than 220 by 120 millimeters of mercury. Also, those who have unexplained hypotension, that is where the systolic blood pressure is less than 80 millimeters of mercury, or if there are any other contraindications to exercise testing, we should exclude those subjects. So I think these are some of the precautions that you should keep in mind. And what are the requisites before proceeding to the test? So you need to explain the entire test procedure to the subject. You have to perform the basic clinical examination. You have to screen for the health risk and take a proper history of the subject. He is required to fill a pro forma before investigation and in that pro forma he will be filling in all the details related to his health history. Also, we are supposed to record the basic information and the anthropometric parameters such as the age, height, weight and gender as well as the test conditions that is the environmental conditions and the protocol that we are using. We have to perform an appropriate warm up for the subject. We have to ask him to do a little bit warm up exercise before actually binging on to the main test. We measure always as a mandate the baseline blood pressure as well as the resting heart rate and resting respiratory rate. Uh, moving back to the slide, what are the other concerns? So we've discussed the subject preparation. We have discussed the prerequisites and the precautions. Now, which test we should go on for uh, testing your VO2 max? Now, exercise tests are usually performed under two categories. One is under constant workload and the other is increasing workload. So constant workloads, they are designed in such a manner that the person reaches a steady state of gas exchange and ventilation and heart rate, thereby investigating the cardiopulmonary function under the constant metabolic demand. I repeat here once again that the test type can be under two categories. 
one under constant workload and the other is increasing workload. So what do you need to keep in mind? In case of constant workload, your body is having a constant metabolic demand. It is not rising in proportion to your exercise. The other modality is increasing workload, which is used to see exhaustion in the subject. That is when you have to determine a maximum level of oxygen consumption. So for this, generally cycle ergometers and treadmills are employed and step walking tests are used for the constant workloads. So the protocol that we are using uh, includes two kinds of exercise. One is isotonic or dynamic exercise and the other is isometric or static exercise. The third category has also been mentioned in some of the uh, literature references and that is resistive, wherein you incorporate both the combined isometric as well as isotonic variety. Now the dynamic protocols, they are most frequently used to assess your cardiovascular reserve and they are suitable for clinical testing and they should always include a low intensity warm up. In general, six to 12 minutes of continuous progressive exercise during which your myocardial oxygen demand is elevated to the patient's maximum level is the one that is optimal for the diagnostic and prognostic purposes. So that's why the lab uh, protocol is the increasing workload protocol. So, and any kind of protocol, uh, if you are following, it should always include a suitable recovery or a cool down period. I must mention as a note over here that all the cardiorespiratory changes in response to exercise, they have to return to the pre-exercise level within four to five minutes after the stoppage of exercise. So here I need to emphasize the importance of the recovery period, which I will tell you later on as well. So this is all about the test time and the uh, kind of exercise module that we are going to use. Now we shall discuss how we are performing the test in the lab. So the modality or the protocol here is labeled as running maximal oxygen consumption test for the measurement of the aerobic fitness parameter that is VO2 max. Now this VO2 max is determined as international standard of physical capacity and a person's cardiorespiratory fitness that is quantifiable as VO2 max is generally considered by the exercise physiologist as one of the best indicators of physical fitness. Now, this is a criterion measure of the aerobic power in athletes. This measure, this method is going to measure the VO2 max using the running exercise on a treadmill. So here again, I'm going to take a little break and make you all uh, visualize how our subjects are exercising in our lab. So again, a video is uh, being shared with you in order to see the treadmill exercise performed by one of our MBBS students. And he was a state level athlete who has represented our institute in the events. So just take a look. So I hope you all um, 
for the eyes as much as I had when we were recording because the subject is running on the speed of around 11 kmph. So how do we proceed from here? The measurement of the oxygen uptake is done from the measures of the ventilation and the oxygen and carbon dioxide in the expired air from the graph and the data pad view, which I will just show you shortly. And heart rate is being measured constantly. The result is always expressed as liters of oxygen per minute or ml of oxygen per kg of the body weight per minute. After the test, that is post-test uh, recovery values have to be noted. We have to again measure the blood pressure as well as the heart rate. So we allow the subject to relax and get hydrated. Now the target population for this running test is Generally, it is suitable for any kind of sport where you require aerobic endurance as one of the major component. So it is almost the best option for the sports which are involving the athletic events like running, swimming, etc. So there are certain advantages of this test. When you use a treadmill running exercise mode, it is suiting the best range of athletes and it is almost familiar with most of the people and it uses your whole body musculature as compared to the other modality that we have, which is uh, the ergometer exercise. So a glimpse of the methodology which we had followed after we familiarized the subject with the laboratory and the procedure, we subject him to an incremental ramp exercise test so that his limit of tolerance is reached on a motorized treadmill. How do we select the speed? It is done in a stepwise manner following this protocol wherein we start the speed from zero and it is increased to four kilometers per hour in the first minute and subsequently we increase it by one kilometer per hour every minute till volitional fatigue. So how do you assess these VO2 max values? It is during a five to eight minute increasing speed run to exhaustion. So this is the picture of the same subject and the model that we have for uh, motorized treadmill. We also have a facility for exercise on the cycle ergometer because we have the entire setup. So here you can see the subject is exercising on a motorized cycle ergometer. He's wearing a watch-like thing, which is nothing but it is a wrist-worn pulse oximeter, which is meant for constant subject monitoring. It delivers fast and accurate oxygen saturation as well as the pulse rate readings in challenging conditions, including motion or as in during the exercise. So the wrist oxygen OH2 provides us with continuous reliable SO2 monitoring and data recording as well. So here you can see in this picture, 96 is the SpO2 value and 75 is the heart rate. So this is a uh, one of the mode or one of the means by which we are uh, following this section of our protocol that is the subject monitoring. Moving further, how do we decide uh, while the person is exercising that uh, whether he has reached VO2 max or not? So the subject is considered to have reached the VO2 max or a valid maximal test is considered when at least two of the following criteria are achieved. That is, the first one is a plateau or a peaking over in the oxygen uptake or oxygen consumption, which we have abbreviated already as VO2. The second criteria is whether the subject has attained his maximal heart rate. Now, how do you calculate maximal heart rate? Many of you might be knowing, those who are teaching and reading physiology, it is 220 minus age of the individual in years. Or attainment of a maximal heart rate, which is more than or equal to the age predicted maximum for that individual. The third criteria is attainment of a respiratory exchange ratio that is also abbreviated as RER when its value is greater than or less than greater than or equal to 1.15. So it's a ratio, it's a figure. When it exceeds 1.1 or equalizes this number, we say that yes, VO2 max for the person has been uh, attained. Now, many of you might uh, disagree with me that uh, plateau is not always obtained when you are uh, 
recording the VO2. So a plateau in the actual VO2 response is not an obligatory consequence of the incremental exercise because sometimes you do not obtain the plateau, rather you get a peak value. But actually that is not different from the plateau that we get at constant workloads for the plot of VO2 versus work rate. So uh, making you all aware with the lab chart view that we get in our software, the first graph is a graph of VO2 in ml per kg per minute uh, uh, or uh, in context with the time that is recorded in seconds. So here it's an uh, original recording from one of our subject and you can see the maximal VO2 that was reached is 64.13 ml per kg per minute after having inserted the subject details into the metabolic module. So here you get it through a cursor in the graph itself over the top, I think. Uh, y is equal to 64.129. Uh, it is already showing us the value. Yes, I would be using this feature of Zoom again to highlight. Yes, I think it's better for you to understand the Y axis. Uh, the Y uh, is showing us a value of 64.13. Similarly, in the graph that is mentioned uh, side to, uh, besides this is RER again plotted against the time in second. So you can pick zoom in your mobile phones or in your devices and see for the uh, respective values. Here it is given as y is equal to 1.17. So the peak of VO2 that is attained on a maximal effort incremental test is likely to be a valid index of VO2 max despite no evidence of a plateau in the data itself. So uh, many of you who do not know what is RER, I would like to explain a little bit about this concept, respiratory exchange ratio. Not much of a rocket science. It is simply the ratio or it's a, uh, you can say uh, the value of amount of carbon dioxide that is produced from the exercising individual divided, be, uh, divided by the oxygen consumed. So a ratio of amount of CO2 produced to the oxygen consumed. Now, this calculation is commonly done in conjunction with the exercise tests, such as uh, estimation of uh, VO2 max, and it can be used as an indicator for the participants, which are uh, nearing the exhaustion and the limits of the cardiorespiratory system. So as I already mentioned, RER uh, greater than or equal to 1.15 is used as an endpoint criterion for the VO2 max or the peak. So this ratio uh, is normally expressed as a fraction and in healthy individuals, it is well below zero and is around 0.7 to 0.8. So when the value is below zero, that means the person is burning more of fats. And when it is above zero, that means the person is utilizing or he's burning his carbohydrates in that case. So initially, when the first, uh, when the person is breathing into the respiratory circuit for the first time, the RER seems to be elevated. You will come to know from the data pad view over here. So it's a metabolic log window here. We have this column. So you can say it is already uh, higher on the higher side. So but the reason for this is that initially the subject is hyperventilating. So that's why the RER values are more. Now, whenever it becomes greater than unity, uh, it means that the aerobic metabolism is producing more of carbon dioxide from the buffering of the lactate, that is the lactic acid that is being produced. And henceforth, the VCO2 becomes greater. So you have a greater value for the numerator as compared to the oxygen. So that is the reason and the relationship of the RER with VO2 and VCO2. Now, let me uh, explain this particular lab chart view of our metabolic layout that we have customized. And it is showing you the various channels which are giving us the input uh, signals and 
this is the block or the plot between the RER versus time. This one is the waterfall plot, ECG waterfall plot, <coughs> which is again, just a moment, <coughs> which is again showing us the cluster of the uh, ECG waves, which are uh, accumulated every 40 seconds. So the data logging time, you can again pin zoom to your devices and see that the data logging time is around 40 seconds. So after every 40 seconds, we get a data value in the particular column in the log window. The left hand side is the VO2 max uh, graph or rather VO2 graph versus time where we get the peak value and it is labeled as VO2 max and you can see very clearly in the graph that is besides it which is uh, v CO2 versus time. It is almost a replica of the VO2 curve so the person is <coughs> exhaling the VO, uh, VCO2 as much as he's consuming the oxygen. Again, you can uh, further uh, zoom out uh, your uh, screens and you can see that uh, this data pad view is containing the sampling values which we are derived, which we have derived from these channels. So just to enumerate them, we have the first channel as percentage oxygen, then percentage carbon dioxide, respiratory rate, breath temperature, the tidal val volume, SpO2 that we are recording through the wristwatch, then the respiratory rate, the tidal volume, and the heart rate, which is again recorded with the help of the polar belt as well as the wristwatch that is being worn by the subject. So constant ECG monitoring during the exercise, constant heart rate, SpO2 monitoring has been done. And these are the values which we are getting recorded every 40 seconds. <clears throat> I would like to now uh, explain the log window in detail. So I'll take you to the uh, log window view that is in this particular slide. So I'll explain each and every column uh, in detail. The first is the data logging time. The second is VE. Can any one of you guess what this VE would stand for? And the thing that's written in its bracket BTP is. Please give me your answers in the chat box with VE and BTPS full forms. I'll allot a minute of time to you. Excellent. So I got the first answer correct. VE stands for minute ventilation. May I have the answer for BTPS as well? Well done. So glad to be in front of uh, such knowledgeable attendees. I've got both the answers correct. So we have BTPA standing for body temperature and pressure standard. So let us uh, shed a little more light on to what this VE means. So actually the E stands for expired minute ventilation. The unit is liters per minute. It is the total volume that is either inspired or expired over a one minute period. So while we are using VE, it can also be VI, but I would mention here that for performing the exercise physiology studies, it is always the expired air which is sampled and analyzed. So here we are using the VE that is expired minute ventilation. At rest, the normal values are 5 to 10 liters per minute, but it might increase to 150 liters per minute in trained athletes and up to 50 liters per minute in a healthy adult. Why does this increase occur? This increase in ventilation removes the carbon dioxide from the working muscles. 
So at low or moderate levels of exercises, this ventilation volume increasing linearly with the workload and also the oxygen consumption. Whereas at higher levels, it increases to more than 60% of the VO2 max aerobic ventilatory mechanisms uh, when they are failing to meet the demands that are required for energy production. So then the non-aerobic means are going to generate the energy. So the anaerobic glycolysis starts producing lactate. As the lactate concentration increases in the muscle, the buffering of the lactic acid by the serum bicarbonate occurs subsequently, increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So VCO2 then increases as the carbon dioxide is removed through the cardiorespiratory system. The next column, now BTPS, yes, I got the answer for the BTPS also correct. That is body temperature, uh, pressure, saturated, uh, body temperature, pressure, saturate. So how does it differ from STPD? STPD stands for standard temperature and pressure. So again, uh, time for you to answer me. Uh, what are the values for standard temperature and standard pressure? Quickly, 30 seconds time. How much is the standard temperature and pressure? for the full form of STPP, that is standard temperature pressure drag. Pressure is atmospheric pressure, yes, that is around 760. Excellent. So we have standard pressure value coming up in the chat box as 760 millimeters of mercury. May I know how much is the standard temperature? ST is ST is 273 uh, Kelvin or 0 degrees. Okay, so we proceed further that always we stop the discussion here, please. Okay, always you should mention or you should recognize that ventilation volume is mentioned as BTPS, whereas the values of VO2 and VCO2 are always measured in STBP. Because to go from saturate to dry air, we are using already the napheon tubing and the desiccant cartridge, which is removing the water vapor. We all are aware as physiologists or uh, as the science students or the persons who have gone through the medicine uh, curriculum that uh, when you are expiring the air, the air gets humidified and it gets warmed when it is passing through the respiratory passages. So the content increases, the heat content, as well as the water vapor content increases. So that has to be taken care of or accounted for when you are doing the experimental studies like exercise physiology. So you are catering to that moisture by getting it removed through the desiccant cartridge that is having the napheon tubing. Uh, proceeding to the main column of our interest today and our session that is VO2, that is volume of oxygen that has been uh, consumed by the individual who is exercising and mind you, it is at STPD. I repeat once again, standard temperature pressure drive. Now, how much is the resting value for VO2? Normally, under resting condition, it is about 0.25 liters per minute. But can you imagine how long, it, how much it can increase? It can be increased to 3.5 liters per minute for an exercising subject. And it may increase to well over 4 liters per minute for well-trained athletes or the subjects who have been trained in a particular sport. So here again, a bit of flushing of the gray matter. I would like to ask you, does anyone know how much is the world record for the VO2 max? The latest world record for the VO2 max. Normal, we know that it is around uh, 42 or 43 ml per kg for the males and for females, it's around 36 ml per kg. Excellent. I got 
the value correct from one of our attendees. It's 96.6 ml per kg per minute and it is from a Norwegian cross-country skier. So correct value for, so that is your target. Those of you who are interested to get their VO2 max assess that people can even go up to that level. Anyway, moving further. So from this particular column, that is VO2, uh, where we are getting the subsequent uh, values in this uh, particular column after every 40 seconds, here you can make out that this was the maximal value which I have highlighted and corresponding to this, the RER value is 1.17. So this is how we can make out that the person has reached up to and how do we again uh, after looking at the plot, we can also uh, make out that it is coinciding with the value of Y which we got initially here. Got it. So all these graphs are from the same subject, so they are all correlating. Uh, moving to the next column, VCO2, that is the carbon dioxide production, giving us the expression in liters per minute or in ml per kg per minute. It is the volume of carbon dioxide that is produced by a subject in liters per minute at STPD. For a normal person, the value is around 0.2 liters per minute at rest. And it, it, it can also increase to over 4 liters per minute, just like VO2. And it is directly proportional to the alveolar carbon dioxide concentration. So just to give you a glimpse of the formula, not going into much technical details, how we calculate or how we retrieve that formula. For VO2, the simple formula is inspired oxygen minus expired oxygen. And for VCO2, again, it is expired carbon dioxide minus inspired carbon dioxide okay so the next column is RER we have already defined this very well so no need to discuss about it the second last column is REE -E. so what does this stand for this is resting energy expenditure that is the minimum amount of calories which are required by a person each day last one is again of uh, clinical importance that is the METS value METS stands for metabolic energy expenditure and it is simply signifying the multiples of resting oxygen consumption. So uh, generally when we start with the exercise it's around two or three but as the grading of the exercise or the severity increases the value keeps on rising and just to note over here in this uh, metabolic log view the person when he had attained 64 VO2 the value of METS was 18.325. So running at much higher speeds than we can expect or we can perform. Now, what is the utility? Why you are doing this cardiorespiratory assessment in any sports physiology lab? This parameter and its quantification is actually symbolizing the effective integration of the three systems, the neural system, cardiopulmonary, and the metabolic system. And it is a very strong predictor of the adverse health outcomes. So the Obtaining the accurate and the valid VO2 max values is of utmost importance when you are uh, comparing or equaling the individuals or the groups or when you are performing a longitudinal follow-up study and you are following the subjects through the time duration or when various modes of exercise are used and they are being compared. I would like to let my audience know that we have already conducted a ICMR study on both the modalities, that is the treadmill as well as the ergometer. So we have used both the modes of exercise and evaluated the VO2 max uh, in either conditions. So with this, I come to the end of my presentation related to VO2 max. Uh, my take home note for my attendees is that a better cardiorespiratory fitness is known to translate into a lower cardiac risk in future. So keep exercising regularly to stay fit and do not make your waste a wasteland, rather know your VO2 max. So I hope you enjoyed the ride through this session. Uh, now it's a brainstorming time and time to tickle your brain cells. So there are a few questions which are going to be uh, flashed on to you for, as a part of the poll or the survey. So I hand over the session to the technical persons from ADI. Maybe Sumant is going to uh, take over from now for the poll and for the questions to the participants. Thank you so much.
Suman? Ya. Thanks for your active participation in the poll. So uh, there were quite a lot of questions. I think uh, we have uh, uh, typed in most of the answer. Uh, there is one question in particular uh, uh, from Dr. Mohan Babu. Uh, I wanted to know the, the spirometer settings and the units conversion. I would uh, request if ask an answer. Aspai, are you there? Yeah. So um, uh, the spirometer settings, uh, we actually have a uh, spirometer uh, extensions, which will be uh, built in with lab chart. Uh, and that can be used for unit conversion. That is a uh, software calibration. It will do automatically. Uh, probably we could we could set up a meeting to show you how it can be done. Uh, it is all software based. So we just need to select proper flow and volume to convert the units. And then there's a, a unit conversion tab in lab chart. So that can be taken care by software itself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we are just about to end the polling. So uh, whoever not participated, uh, we, we, we allow maybe uh, 10, 20 more seconds. So we request all of them to actively participate. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to type in so that uh, we can answer. Uh, so that's one more question on the risk during the procedure. Uh, would any any of the panelists uh, like to take the answer? I mean the question. Can you repeat, Sumanth, please. Uh, Ma'am, there is a question on the uh, the risk during the the procedure. Yeah, I have already mentioned whether, uh, it. The question says whether do we need a. Do we need a? Do, do we need a physician ready? Yes, I would like to highlight that uh, we are running the VO2 um, max test in our lab and we are well equipped with all the life-saving measures, including the various tablets, injections, and a nursing personnel with us. And also the oxygen cylinder is always kept ready. So um, yes, that has to be always a backup thing has always to be there, uh, should be there while you are assessing any subject for any CPET or cardiopulmonary efficiency testing. You cannot proceed without having those equipments and life-saving devices with you with this kind of an exercise. Although you will always be following the prerequisites that I have mentioned in my slides and also the things to be kept in mind. If you want, we can share those two slides with our participants who are requiring for this particular question. Thank you. So Sumant will tell us the poll results uh, in a glimpse. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, the the question number one on the VO2 max, the, the VO2 max is also known as, so the correct answer is all of the above. So aerobic capacity, aerobic fitness, as well as the maximum O2 uptake. And uh, how can you tell if the VO2 max was reached? So the, the correct answer is 1.15 of RER or greater. So some people also consider as a, uh, the the maximum VO2 which is reached during the test, but in in addition, people consider 1.15 or the the maximum VO2. So that is the correct uh, uh, measure of the VO2 max. The third one, what does the V stands for? I think Ma'am has uh, uh, 
uh, explained very nicely. V stands for the the volume, so that is the correct answer. So thanks everyone for the uh, the participation in the polls. So uh, there are some more uh, uh, questions probably before we move on. Uh, I would just like to read out. Uh, so uh, there were a couple of questions on the protocols. So I think the the protocol depends on the the study and the user because there are uh, a lot of uh, protocols. It depends on what type of uh, exercise, whether it is based on the treadmill or uh, ergometer. So I think most common is the Bruce, and uh, there are a lot of people who are uh, uh, working on the uh, the modified Bruce as well as uh, some of the Princeton University and so on. But protocols can be uh, completely up to the end user or the uh, the researcher who who are uh, looking at a particular uh, study. So, can we proceed to the next uh, segment of the webinar? Yes, please, ma'am. Please. Okay. So we have discussed the VO2 assessment. Now taking you all towards the cardiovascular assessment during the exercise. Now uh, the cardiovascular assessment, primarily uh, the subject preparation, the electrodes and all, I have already shown the audience in the uh, preliminary video where we were uh, preparing the subject with the polar belt and the sensor vest uh, along with the various equipment. So we are going to precisely focus on the wireless ECG and the HRV that is derived from that. So that is going to be incorporated as a cardiovascular assessment. So I would like to introduce the heart rate variability, the prime index in focus or in context of the cardiovascular assessment. Uh, most of you must be aware, must be using uh, this particular uh, parameter in your labs or in your uh, areas. But still, just to brush up your knowledge, uh, the HRV is defined as the cardiac interbeat variation. And it is becoming one of the most useful tools for assessing the complex and constantly changing variations in the oscillations of a healthy heart as it consists of changes in the time interval between two beats or consecutive heartbeats. It is an affordable, non-invasive, practical and reproducible measure of the autonomic input to the heart. It is commonly used in the research as a gold standard technique for the autonomic modulation. So we all know that in a normal healthy subject, each heartbeat is initiated by the SA node known as the sinoatrial node that is located in the posterior wall of the right atrium. The myocytes in this area exhibit what is referred to as a leaky conductance across the membranes, which results in a regular and a uniform discharge of action potentials that causes the heart to contract at a constant frequency. So ordinarily, there are many factors which can constantly modulate the autorhythmicity of the sinoatrial firing rate. And this is achieved by way of autonomic nervous system having its two opposing arms, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic governed by the vagal innervation. So by examining the heart beat to beat variation, one can therefore effectively gain a proper insight into the autonomic nervous system tone. So quantifying the sympathovagal tone is one of the major goals of a physiologist when you are analyzing this parameter that is HRV. So healthy biological systems which exhibit these complex patterns of variability, they can be described by this mathematical chaos because there are going to be a lot of indices in picture. We know that a healthy heart is not a metronome and its oscillations are complex and constantly changing over time. So a heart rate which is variable and responsive to the demand of the body is believed to bestow a survival advantage Whereas, on the other hand, the heart who is having a reduced HRV might be associated with the poorer cardiovascular health and the outcomes. So the clinical application of HRV is mainly associated with the prediction of a sudden cardiac death 
assessing the cardiovascular and metabolic illness, illness progression. Analysis of HRV also permits an insight into the interdependent regulatory system, which enables us to combat any sudden physical challenge to the homeostasis in a situation just like which arises when a person undertakes exercise. Now, what are the equipments which are required for wireless ECG and from where we can derive HRV? It is the same old Hamara power lab that is 8 by 35 channel, which is having a lab chat uh, data analysis software. So the ECG recordings are done with this acquisition system and the analysis is done by the same software. But to note at this point, the module that we are using is called as heart rate variability module which helps us to analyze the interbeat interval variation in the ECG recordings. So this is the device and the apparatus which is required. As you can see, the subject is wearing a sensor belt, as I mentioned in our preparation video as well. It is known as equivital sensor belt. This allows an equivital SEM to be worn securely on the body. Now, what is SEM? SEM stands for Sensor Electronics Module, and it has to be securely placed in the pouch that is created in the, that is present in the vest. And this equivital sensor belt, it has two shoulder straps for a better fit and an improved facility. So uh, it also contains two ports and pouches which are required to securely store and interface with both the SEM itself as well as an external battery pack or GSR modules can also be used. GSR stands for galvanic skin response and it is designed to last at least 25 washes. Why I'm mentioning here is because we have already conducted over 300 recordings with the ECG vests that are available with us. So we had to constantly go on for washing because a person sweats a lot when he's exercising on such high treadmill speeds. So the belt is available in uh, four to five convenient sizes. So here I've mentioned the dimensions in centimeters as well as in inches. So accordingly, you can decide whether the vest of size two, three, four or five or six, whichever suits you better or fits you properly, where your electrodes are touching the skin that is supposed to be chosen amongst the various sizes. So this is the device we are using for wireless physiological monitoring of your cardiovascular system. Now, this wireless monitoring in the sports science, it is providing you the freedom of movement for the subjects, ensuring a realistic human activity in your research. Now, this layout is known as the ECG layout. Here we are also getting your waterfall plot and where I was telling you that the clustering of the ECG waves in a particular time duration is showing us the values of uh, more of sympathetic dominance or parasympathetic dominance. So as long as it is blue, it is good. If it becomes red, that means it is going more towards the um, sympathetic overactivity. Now, this channel, as you can see in your layout, uh, is representing the ECG that we had obtained from this wireless equivital system. On top, I would like to focus over here. Again, you can all pinch zoom because the rest of the graphs are not important here in this context. What is more important is this uh, layout of the channel settings. So please concentrate on these uh, waveforms which are coming. These are signifying the RR interval. Those are derived from the polar transmitter belt. I would tell you in detail about this device also. And the lower orange panel over here, these signals are the normal ECG wave. Uh, similar to that lead to getting from the wireless sensor beds. So this is again a magnified view of the similar thing. Again, I would like to repeat once again, look at this channel. Here it is labeled as RR. So we are getting the RR intervals. And here they, these RR intervals are coinciding with the R waves, which are seen in this ECG panel as well. So it is our choice of... Uh, option which one to choose from in order to calculate the HRV indices. Now, where do we get those RR? What I'm explaining now, just pay attention that this channel or these signals are received from this wireless heart rate kit, which contains 
two things. One is a polar receiver interface cable that's around three meters in length, and the other is a polar transmitter with the chest straps. So when we were demonstrating the subject preparation, I was pointing again and again to that black polar transmitter, which has to be kept as close to the chest as possible so that it can pick up the signals of RR interval very well. So this polar transmitter can transmit up to a range of about 1.2 meters or four feet feet. It has a battery life with a minimum of 1500 operating hours and it is supplied with three sizes of the chest straps, small, medium and large. And they are designed to transmit the heart rate signals to the polar receiver interface cable, which is then connected and analyzed by the power lab as well as the lab chart. So the procedure to derive the HRV indices for HRV, we don't need anything but a short term five minute recording of ECG that is being extracted according to the standards which are already set forth by the task force of the European Society of Cardiology and North American Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology given in 1996. So as per this, there are two methods of analysis of HRV data. One is the time domain and the other is the frequency domain analysis. Most of our audience must be well aware of these terms. Still, I would emphasize and let you know what individually these mean. The spectral as well as the time domain indices of HRV are using the RR interval that is based on ECG computed and analyzed by the software. So for performing the wireless ECG recording, we always give a detailed explanation of the protocols and the precautions that we need to keep in mind to each of our subjects. And of course, again, uh, re-ensuring that the informed written consent has been taken by the subject before proceeding to the wireless recording. Now the time domain indices include number one, the mean RR interval, which is measured in the seconds. Second is the standard deviation of this NN interval. Now I've replaced RR with NN. It is nothing but replacing it with the values of normal to normal R interval. Okay, RR interval. So NN interval refer to the intervals between normal R peaks of the PQRS complex. The third parameter is the square root of the mean squared difference of the NN intervals that is... Uh, acronym as RMSSD. NN50 is the adjacent NN intervals that differ from each other by more than 50 milliseconds. And the last one is PNN50, that is the percentage of NN50. So in a nutshell, what these time domain indices mean, they are actually representing the overall variability of the heart rate that is generated by the SC node over the time of the recording. The second set of indices that are derived are known as uh, frequency domain indices. When we have excluded all the artifacts and the ectopics from the RR interval uh, series that were chosen from the polar transmitter, then these frequency spectrum components are being uh, analyzed through the fast Fourier transformation. And this is how we get the value. So the uh, components are categorized as total power, indicating the variance of NN intervals over the temporal segment. The frequency range is uh, corresponding to approximately less than or equal to 0.4 Hertz. Very low power or very low frequency is the power in the very low frequency range. That is from 0 to 0.04 Hertz, low frequency, this is an important indicator of the sympathetic innervation or the activity of the heart. So it is 0.04 to 0.15 Hertz. LF norm is nothing but the same value of LF bar when it is in normalized units. So you have a particular formula for getting the value of LF norm. It is LF divided by the total power minus the VLF multiplied by 100. HF stands for power in the high frequency range that is parasympathetic dominance indicating the parasympathetic activity of the heart. HF norm stands for HF power in the normalized units just similar to LF norm. It is again given by a formula HF divided by total power minus VLF into uh, 100. That's the percentage. And last is the most significant 
index of the frequency domain uh, indices that is known as LFHF ratio. Mind you, keep uh, this thing noted that it is sympathovagal balance and not vagosympathetic balance. Why so? Because as you can see, the numerator is LF that is indicating the sympathetic activity. So when we say LFHF ratio, we mean actually it is a sympathovagal balance. That is the balance of the activity of both the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic, which is innervating your heart. Now, I would like to hand over uh, the session for a moment to one of our uh, research scholars, Ms. Nikta Sharma, who has uh, already uh, conducted and completed a ICMR research on uh, HRV. So she would help you understand all the graphs that are being plotted as a result of the HRV analysis and would highlight their importance as well. So uh, Snigta, you may now control the screen and you can take charge. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we've seen how we prepare our subjects and how they exercise and how we record the readings. So um, we previously saw a layout where we saw that we can record our uh, respiration rate, SpO2, heart rate and ECG at the same time. So because of the wireless ECG vest, it becomes easier for us. We can calculate the cardiorespiratory parameters together so the subject doesn't have to come again and again for the exercise. Now, because we use the short-term HRV, we needed the data for the five minutes uh, period. So we can simply go to the column of ECG. We can click and drag whatever recording we need for the five period time. And with the help of the AD team, you can customize the format that you want. Like we ask them to help us customize, customize our layout for HRV. So in the toolbox, we can go to HRV and we can exclude all the ectopic beats so that we can reduce the outliers. So uh, in, the, in the graph on the left hand corner, you can see that there is a HRV classifier plot. Uh, so once we, uh, uh, we select the option to exclude the ectopics, we again get the HRV classifier plot where we can manually select once again the beats that we want to select or not. So all the dots that you see here are the heart rates in the given period of time that you've selected. And then for the research purposes for our study, we get different graphical representations as well. We can get a histogram plot, a tachogram, and a point care plot. So every point here represents the heart rate at that point. So finally, when we go, when you're satisfied with the readings, you can go to the column of HRV and select a report view. Uh, Ma'am, can you please click it from your side? Thank you. Uh, so this is the HRV report. As you can see, we get the general information. We get the time period. Like you can see, we've selected a time uh, 4 minutes 36 seconds to 9 minutes 32 seconds. So it's a 5 minute uh, time timeline. We can get the total number of beats that are included. And as you can see, the included ectopic beats are zero. Now, depending on what study you're doing, whatever parameters you need, at this, you can get the time domain and the frequency domain indices, and you can use them according to your study. Now, this software, it helps you to save the raw data as well. So you can always go back, select a different time frame, and you can compare your recordings as well. So it comes in handy for students uh, as well as professors who are doing their research. So, and once you understand the software, it's very easy uh, to operate. So it's not very hectic for undergraduate students as well. So it actually helps in the research methodology. So uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I would now request Dr. Ruchi to please conclude the presentation. Thank you, Snigda, for that uh, riveting brief and uh, telling us more about all the graphs in detail. I hope the audience would uh, have been able to grasp the concept in a much better way. 
So moving to my concluding slide. And again, the take home message uh, from uh, the this description of HRV. Uh, baseline information about the HRV parameters can always help in testing the response of the cardiac function to any kind of stress that a person experiences. Here in this case, we have mentioned the exertion that is produced as a result of the exercise. So from a functional standpoint, HRV indices enable us to understand how exercise demands specific response of the frequency spectrum and the time domain spectrum when the fatigue starts to compromise the mechanical response of the body. I think again, it is the time for you all to uh, go for a brainstorming. So we still have more questions for the poll session or the survey. So whatever you have understood out of this uh, discussion on HRV and cardiovascular assessment, now you need to exercise and see how much you can attempt. So the questions are going to be flashed again by, I think, uh, from the technical team. So you will need to answer them and then we will resume with uh, the last part of our uh, webinar. Uh, Sumanth, so uh, will you please flash the questions for the poll? Yeah, sure. Meanwhile, if there are any questions from uh, attendees, uh, no, they can uh, they can put their questions in Q and A. Thank you. And there is a network issue from Sandeep side. Could you flash the questions for the poll? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they're up. I think there should be a time limit for the responses, Suman. How long do we allow them to answer? We will uh, just allow another uh, 20 more minutes, seconds, ma'am. Then we can. Okay, so the time is ticking. Last 20 seconds for the responses to be uh, attempted. Uh, meanwhile, Suman, would you like any one of our panelists to answer any question which were put up in the uh, chat box? Uh, yes, please. Uh, there was a question. Uh, if there are any standard HRV values for the Indian population? Uh, any yes. We have recently, yes, thank you for the question. We have uh, recently uh, floated a paper. Actually, we have communicated it to a PubMed index journal and we it's still in the review process. It has uh, undergone one stage of peer review and it is in the second phase. So probably in this year end, you would be able to see the publication from our side, that is from our lab as a result of around 120 or rather uh, a duplicate of that because we have given argometer as well as treadmill values separately. So a total of uh, 240 recordings and their data of the normative indices will be published very soon. It is, uh, uh, although I would mention that in the current status of literature, it is not yet available in the Indian population as far as we have studied. 
and moreover if the values are there they are always mentioned in the baseline conditions or in the resting condition so the usp of the research that we people have undertaken in our lab is we are doing all the investigations during exercise so those will be coming up maybe uh, very soon as a published paper so if it comes at all i would be sharing it with all the emails of the database that would be available with the adit so the names which uh, you all might have heard from me right now uh, these are the faces to those names so the first one he is uh, mr sujay shrivastav the one who was answering to the question on harvard test she is uh, miss nikta sharma uh, the one who has uh, briefed you about the hrv he is uh, mr suryadev vrindavanan uh, he is uh, pursuing his research in hypertension on treadmill exercise uh, she is miss irfana the one who is uh, doing the research on hrv with hypertension she is miss marina p johnny and she is performing her research on hand grip he is mr shabir ghiwala he is performing on association of the body fat and the other three parameters for uh, your autonomic modulation uh, next to him we have uh, yugal jogar uh, he is again my icmr mentee for uh, the variations in the pcod patients and these two chirpy chaps the one in black is mr aryan mehta and uh, mr satya sriram both of them my extremely important and uh, significant uh, staunch supports for the technical handling from my side so it is satya who is sitting next to me and uh, helping me out in tackling all these uh, features of the zoom meeting and aryan he is in mumbai but he is coordinating with me from day 1 when we had planned for this webinar actually if these two would not have been here uh, i would not have been presenting this webinar in front of you all moreover the reason again from the point of view of aryan is that you might have observed that he was the volunteer in the subject preparation video so hats off to my team of spl which we uh, acronym and which we say that it is the sports physiology laboratory so these are the people who have always stood by me and it's because of them that i am able to perform these kind of seminars and present my research work in front of the people so a big thanks to them uh, before ending up my uh, for the conversation related to the acknowledgement i think i should uh, hand over to suman to please uh, convey the observations of the poll and uh, discuss the answers yeah uh, so there were uh, three questions on the poll so i think uh, most of you have answered correctly the what is the heart rate variability is answer is both first and the second one the changes of the rr interval or the heart beats the second one what does lf hf ratio refer to so the the correct answer is the sympathovagal balance i think uh, most of you have answered correctly the third one which of the following technique is used to obtain the uh, hrv indices so most commonly the ecg is uh, used since the r waves are uh, uh, very precise in the timing so some people also use the the pulse and uh, also some of the beat to beat blood pressure recordings but in this case mostly it is the ecg so thank you for the participation so i'll hand over to ma'am for the for the conclusion okay uh, thanks sumit so the essence of gratitude is hard to capture in words for words can never express nor any sentence can convey the deep sense of thankfulness that i harbor so with due decorum i wish to express humble gratitude to honorable shri dhirubhai ji mehta president of kasturba health society and the chief patron who is our source of motivation providing the financial support for the establishment of central india's first sports physiology laboratory 
I also wish to put on record the gratitude to our Secretary Sir Dr. B. S. Gar and M. S. Dr. S. P. Kalantri Sir for being our sources of perennial encouragement and invaluable support. I also would like to thank our Dean, Dr. N. M. Gagne Sir, for his encouragement and letting us be experimental with ideas. I thank him for granting me the permission to go ahead with this international webinar in this uh, COVID health care. Also, I would like to again put on record my humble gratitude towards the people associated with the ADI team, Mr. Pravesh Pokhriyal, Mr. As Mohammed, and the technical head, Mr. Sumant Bhatt, uh, for whom I am totally at bereft of words to express the gratitude, and Mr. Siddharth, who has actually sown the seed of the thought related to conducting such webinar, uh, wherein I was just not ready to accept the proposal and he was uh, so smart enough to convince me to say yes ultimately so all credits for the hosting of the seminar to uh, Siddharth I must say and then the untiring efforts of Miss Sandeep Kaur and Mr. Chetan for uh, organizing the event in such a uh, uh, commendable manner that everything could go on smoothly so thanks Sandeep and Chetan as well so I think that is all from my side and not to forget which I always do actually is to thank this person on your screen which is Dr. Pradeep Bokaria, my better half so he has been the pillar of support for me always and forever so thanks Pradeep for being there for me always thank you all Thank you, ma'am. So we, we are concluding the session. So once again, we thank uh, all the participants and the panelists for your uh, active participation. Thank you very much once again.